Two Journeys Ministry with Pastor Andy Davis. Biblical teaching to guide you to spiritual maturity. All right, so uh, we're walking through Romans 14, and uh, what a masterpiece um, chapter it is. Remarkable. As Paul addresses issues of uh, unity and diversity, So I've got the entire chapter printed on your handout here. Uh, We've gotten through the first half of it, verses 1 through 12, but I want to get a running start. So if I could get someone to read verses 1 through 12 on the handout, and then I'll read verses 13 through 23, and then we'll begin the study in that way. Accept him whose faith is weak, without passing judgment on disputable matters. One person's faith allows him to eat everything but another person whose faith is weak eats only vegetables the one who eats everything must not look down on him who does not and the one who does not eat everything must not condemn the one who does for god has accepted him who are you to judge someone else's servant to his own master he stands or falls And he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God, and he who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is, it is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Thank you. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. As one who is in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself. But if someone, anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is a man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith, and anything that does not come from faith is sin. All right, so we're dealing with uh, some key issues here that Paul's keeping in a marvelous balance one with another. He's concerned about gospel unity among different believers, that issue of unity. He's concerned about gospel freedom from legalism and judgmentalism, uh, and that is a matter of spiritual maturity. But he's also concerned about gospel holiness. He wants purity from sin. So these are the things that he's dealing with here. So uh, we've already looked at verses 1 through 12. The discussion questions I have are tied to verses 13 through 23. But up to this point, we've been dealing with controversial issues, divisive issues. What are the two issues in particular Paul's addressing as case studies in, in this chapter? 
eating and drinking and uh, uh, observance of holy days. All right, so eating and drinking and then sacred days or holy days. Uh, behind that, of course, is the sense that he's dealing with Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians who will come at those issues differently. So there's that Jew-Gentile issue, which is a dominant theme throughout the whole book of Romans. Again and again, he's addressing uh, Jews at some points, Gentiles at others, etc. He's concerned about that. But this is uh, probably the most famous church in, in Christianity at that point, the church at Rome. So everyone, he says in chapter 16, everyone has heard about your faith. So everyone's watching. So what is his concern in this chapter? What is he worried about? What is he concerned that might happen based on these issues? Division. Meaning what? What would happen? What would be like the ultimate division that would happen in that church? They'd fall out with each other. And it would... Right. They'd stop being one church. Was it possible that there could be a Jewish church and a Gentile church there in Rome? Is that possible? I would say not just possible. It probably was likely if this, the Lord didn't work. JP, were you going to say I'm something? I'm just saying it could be a repeat of what we saw with the Council of Jerusalem. Yeah. You know, where it's salvation itself is, you know, is at risk. You know, the doctrine of salvation. Right. So uh, he's, he's dealing with these issues, and yet he's walking a, a tightrope always. Like, let's take the issue of, of the meat. I think behind it, he doesn't openly say it, but he's dealing with the problem of meat sacrifice to idols. He says it openly in 1 Corinthians 8 through 10. Does Paul have an opinion on this matter? Does he have a thought on this whole topic of meat sacrifice to idols? What does he say? What does he say about it? He said you shouldn't eat them. Okay. All right. He says it's not contagious. Yes. As one who is in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that what? It's right on your page. As one, I'm fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself. What does that mean? No food is unclean in itself. You have food on a table there, on a plate, some meat right there. Is it spiritually unclean? No. No, it's just meat. Meat is meat. But people attach importance to it, and when they start attaching importance to it, if the meat has a history a spiritual history, and if people know that history, then there start to be other issues. Paul has opinions about that, but he does have a way of thinking about meat. Would he like all of the Roman Christians to have his same way of thinking about that topic? Is he confused and wondering, gee, it's up in the air for me, I don't know what to do, is he? No, he's made up his mind, he knows what's right. Not everyone, though, is there. And so the people who aren't there yet on the meat, he calls them what? In, even in this chapter, weak. They're weak in their faith. They're the weaker brother. They're not, they've, they're not developed yet. Another word for weak, I think, would be immature. They've not fully come into their maturity yet. They haven't fully understood their freedoms yet. There's some gospel freedoms. Jesus has declared all foods clean, right? So you can eat them. You can eat any food. You can eat any meat. It doesn't matter. And idols are nothing. They're just chalk blocks of wood or, or stone or something like that. There's nothing there. Nothing the idol, that block of wood, ha can, it can do anything to the meat. But is that all that he says about this? No. He's also saying, if your brother is watching that and he's distressed by what you're doing, you got to be careful about that. That matters. And so he's walking through all of these things. Now, on the issue of the, the weaker brother, they have a sin pattern, don't they? The weaker brother is more legalistic, right? The weaker in this case will be the more legalistic. He'll be the more restrictive. And as legalistic, he's likely to be, have what attitude toward other people? Judgmental. He's going to be judgmental. He's going to judge others by what they're doing on this. What does Paul say about that, about judging others, being judgmental toward others? It's not good. Yes, it's, he says it's not good. <laughs> it's, it's good. Literally, that's what it says. Right there in verse 11, it's not good. <laughs> no, it's true. Yeah, he says it. Any, any more thoughts on that? What, what does he say about judging others? Of course, it's not your place. It's not your place. Is there a judge of all the earth? Yes. yes. Is it you? No. No. Everyone is going to stand before God 
he says, we will all stand before God's judgment seat. Now, it's interesting he says that because we learn in John 5 that Jesus said that the Father has delegated all judgment to him. So, but that's fine. To stand before Jesus on judgment day is the same as standing before God's judgment seat, but it's Christ who's going to be doing the judging. And he says he has won that right by his death and resurrection. He says, for this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. See how he says that in verse nine, he is the Lord of the dead and the living. What does that mean? That Christ is the Lord of both dead and living. Well, it's a little weird because he says in another time that uh, God is not the God of the dead. Right. But there are dead people. Do you believe that, Stephanie? Do you believe there are? All right. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. I don't know what it means. <laughs> um, well, if we're going to get really weird, since you mentioned the word weird, they are disembodied spirits. It's a good time at Halloween to be talking about that, right? <laughs> disembodied. Would you say that Abraham is a disembodied spirit right now? I think he is. Isaac and Jacob, too. They're all disembodied spirits. They are spirits of the righteous made perfect, and they're waiting for the resurrection body. Jesus is their Lord. That's what this verse says. That's mind-blowing. Jesus is Abraham's Lord. He's Isaac's Lord. He's the Lord of the dead, and he's the Lord of the living. He has a right because he died and rose again. That's awesome. What an incredible statement. And he is the judge of your brother, not you. He is in charge of this whole thing, not you. So what right do you have to judge your brother? Stop that. He's very strong on this judgmentalism. Think about Paul's background. What was his background? Was he trained in judgmentalism? Yeah. Yes. What was he? I mean, did he have a religious affiliation? He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. What does that mean? A Pharisee of Pharisees. Like of all the Pharisees, he was the most Pharisee. So that means he was likely to, to be the most judgmental. By the way, you still see some of that flavor in Paul. It comes out from time to time. You know, are they servants of Christ? I am more. He actually says that. 2 Corinthians 11. Um, but he's, he's, he's in that, that evaluation stage where you're evaluating other people's religious practices. He knew what judgmentalism was all about, and he hated it. He had been set free from it. He knew it couldn't save your soul. And he told the Christian church, stop doing that. So I think he's especially dealing with Jewish Christians who are being judgmental toward other Jews who are more mature, actually, than they are. They've come into their gospel freedoms. And he's also judging Gentile Christians for their habits and patterns too, um, or they are. So he's saying, stop doing that. Jesus is, is the judge, and we are all going to stand before God's judgment seat. Now, why is it important for us to think about that? All of us are going to stand before God's judgment seat. We will. <laughs> There's okay. a day of the Lord, and it's coming. Okay. Why is it important for us to think about that? Strong motivation. Okay. Someday you're going to give an account of yourself to God. Keep that in mind. Um, and so it matters what you choose to do. It matters whether you are, uh, you know, whether your conscience is clear. So you should literally never violate your conscience. At the end of verse 23, he's going to give you a basic principle, right? Somebody read verse 23, the very last verse in the chapter. But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eat, because his eating is not from faith, and everything that does not come from faith is sin. So how do you line that up with we will all stand before God's judgment seat? Anything that you do that does not come from faith is sin. And you're going to stand before God's judgment seat. Any thoughts on that? Or you're going to be there a long time. Because I mean, anything that does not come from faith. Okay. Probably a lot for most of us, even as believers, you don't think that much about it. Yeah. So that's a very important verse and maybe one of the most important in the chapter. How, how do you know if what you're doing comes from faith or not? You have a clear conscience about it, I guess. Okay, so you, your conscience matters. Don't ever violate your conscience. If your conscience is bothering you, don't do it. Don't violate your conscience. Um, is it possible for your conscience to be wrong? Yeah, yeah your conscience is not an inerrant, inerrant guide, but you still shouldn't violate it. So what you need to do is educate your conscience and get it up to maturity 
so that your conscience is set free from all these legalistic strictures that were part of your old covenant Jewish lifestyle. But until you're there, don't act any other way. You got to get there first. Because if you've got a conscience problem and you're doing it anyway, you're sinning. Even if you're eating meat that God would want you to eat, if you don't think he doesn't want, if you think he doesn't want you to do it and you do it anyway, you're violating your conscience. So I would say verse 23 is just such an important verse. Ask it every moment, every matter of Christian freedom. Whatever movie you watch, whatever practice you have, whatever food you eat, whatever you do with your free time, whatever, just say, am I doing this by faith or not? Am I doing this in light of an invisible God or not? Am I doing this in light of an invisible judgment day or not? That's what it means to do it by faith or not. Anything that does not come from faith is sin. So I think all of these matters of freedom, you need to uh, see it in light of your relationship with Christ. All right, let's get on now to the second half of the chapter. We've already walked through 1 through 12, but I didn't think we had finished the Judgment Day stuff. So let's talk about verses 13 through 23. Let's look at some main questions. How does this section, verses 13 through 23, unfold a godly vision for unity in the church? How do you see Paul's passion for unity in the church in this chapter, second half especially? You're putting your freedom second to your brother's yeah. uncomfortableness with what you might choose to do. Right. You might have a freedom, but if your brother is hurt by it, what should you do? Refrain from it. Refrain from it. That's what the expression that we got from 1 Corinthians 8 through 10 is love limits liberty. What does that phrase mean to you? Love limits liberty. Well, if we love our brothers and sisters or the ones that we're working with to help them mature, we need to really be careful what we say and the way we say it to them. Right. For sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I think, was it one of you? All right. Go ahead. Yeah, we all struggle with pride, and so sometimes we can do that and flaunt it. We right. flaunt the liberty we have. Yeah. Do you think some, some of those Christians were flaunting their liberties? Probably. I think so. I think in the Corinthian church they were, and I think in the Roman church. Like, I can, I can eat whatever I want. You can't tell me what to do. It's like, yeah, well, in one sense that's true, but in another sense, Paul's going to argue here. If your brother's distressed or troubled by what you're doing, you're not acting in love. It should matter to you how your brother's receiving or dealing with what you're doing. That should matter to you. We're, we're not independent agents. We're, we're all in this together. And so he's, he's really operating from a sense of, of a cohesive unit. We're a family. Brothers and sisters matter. How they're dealing with things, it really matters. Second question, why should Christians be concerned about stumbling blocks we put in front of other Christians? Why should we care about whether someone else is stumbling over what we do? Isn't that like their problem? If you don't like it, don't watch, that kind of thing. Why should we care about these stumbling blocks? Well, as a family, we should, we should, we are invested mm -hmm. in each other's spiritual growth. And okay. so, you know, I want my fellow church members to, to grow, and I don't want to be an impediment to that. Yeah. Yeah, look at verse 15. All right, this is an interesting verse. Someone read verse 15, the whole verse. If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not, by your eating, destroy your brother for whom Christ died. All right, so there's two D words in there. The first is distressed, but what is the second? Destroy. Wow. That's a strong word. In verse 15, he says, do not, by your eating, destroy your brother. Now, how do we understand that word destroy? I think of like spiritually leading astray and sending them, making them believe something that that's not true. Okay. It just confuses them. It's just not helpful. It's extremely not helpful. All right, let's start putting boundaries around the word destroy. Does it mean send him to hell? Can my eating send my Christian brother to hell? No, so it doesn't mean eternally destroy, but it's still a strong word. It's still a very strong word. So then what, if, we're not gonna, if I'm not gonna destroy his soul in hell, what could I destroy by flaunting my freedoms in front of him? What could I destroy? Again, let's, let's try to understand who this individual is. This is perhaps a Gentile convert 
who's recently come out of paganism, has managed to stop the habits of going to the temple prostitutes, still struggles with lust in that area, but is getting that whole lifestyle under control, comes to church and sees the, the Jewish Christian who's super mature eating the very meat that he swore off. He's not eating meat because it's all part of that lifestyle. What would be destroyed in that individual at that point? If he's a genuine Christian, he's not going to go to hell. But what could you destroy by eating? By your eating, what would be destroyed? You might think badly of you and not think that you're a very... So your unity is destroyed. Yeah. Like the, the any friendship or relationship is destroyed. He doesn't want to be around you. And their own faith. Their own faith is being destroyed. Not faith in Christ, saving faith, but it's damaged. Somebody else. Well, it was just like... If that's the, the attitude, well, if that's how Christians are, I want nothing to do with it. Okay. I want to back away from it. Okay. okay. Or worse, what's different about a Christian? Here I am trying to flee an ungodly lifestyle into a godly lifestyle. I'm looking for contrast, right. and you've just ruined that. Right. So his certitude about what he should do about his old lifestyle and paganism is destroyed. He doesn't really have a strategy right now. Like, what am I supposed to do about this? How far can I go? Can I go back to the temple prostitute? Well, you can't do that. Well, can I meet? Yeah, you can do the meet, but not the prostitute. It's like, well, what is it? He's confused. Do you think his peace of mind would be destroyed? Conscience damaged, all right? Sense of assurance is destroyed. Are those things, ma- do those things matter? What about his witness to his unsaved friends? That could be destroyed. They're not sure what this guy's doing at this point. Now, you're doing the temple thing or not. So he is in a world of confusion at this point, deeply troubled, doesn't necessarily want to be around that person anymore, is really struggling. That's the level of destruction we're talking about. It's a very strong word, isn't it? And it's, it's no, it's, we can't go so far as to saying you're going to send him to hell. That cannot be. But you can do a lot of damage to this brother. That's what he's looking at in verse 15. All right, so we should care about that. We've talked in question three about love limits liberty, so let's go on. We talked about verse 23 as a vital verse. Let's go on. Hardly any Christians struggle with the morality of eating meat sacrificed to idols. I don't think. Is there anybody here that's like really wrestling with this issue today? No? Okay. I don't want to make light of it, but I haven't met anyone in my 26 years of being here. It's like, man, this is a problem for me. I'm not sure what idols are receiving meat sacrificed to them here in Durham anyway. Maybe there are some. There's weird stuff. Like in Salem, they used to sacrifice cats. At, I have a different view of Halloween than most people do. I mean, you have to go to Salem, Massachusetts. This is an overt religion up there. It's kind of weird. Anyway, all right. If we're not struggling with that, how, what are issues today that would be like this meat sacrifice to idols issue or issues of Christian liberty, Christian freedom that cause struggle within Christian churches? Uh, we, we had Quaker friends when we lived in Pennsylvania, and um, if you don't know anything about that, they don't like musical instruments. Okay. Um, and you can imagine, coming back to your example, if you have a, a rock band member trying to come out of a drug-infested, heavy metal lifestyle, you know, and the instruments, you know, you could argue maybe uh, either specific instruments or the use of a specific application of some of those instruments. They would cite, hey, there are no musical instrument citations in the New Testament. You'd be hard-pressed to find one. Lots of examples of the human voice. Yeah, yeah, very good. You know, the old, I mean, it's still in a lot of places, hymns and choruses. Okay, worship styles, songs, different things like that. Personal preferences. Yeah, for me, one of the number one, and it's just so broad, but... What does it mean to love the world or worldliness and engagement with the world's culture, the world's entertainments, the world's music, movies, books, culture, the level to which different Christians can engage in that and sin or not sin is different from person to person, wouldn't you say? So some people can watch movies that others can't. Some people can go places that other Christians can't. You know, I would say uh, for people that have struggled with alcoholism, there's uh, like alcohol can be a freedom that could be abused. Um, You know, for myself, I don't drink alcohol. I understand it's a matter of Christian freedom, but there could be others that have struggled mightily with that problem. And then if they see other Christians flaunting freedoms, they can be hurt by that. 
So that would be examples. I think dress codes are, can be issues, how people dress, you know, how women dress, whether they dress to allure or just to be attractive. That can be an issue of Christian freedom, but is your brother destroyed by your freedom? So that'd be an example where, you know, Christian sisters want to be careful what they wear so they don't destroy their brother by, by their freedoms. Like, I have the freedom to wear whatever I want. Well, this, that leads you right into the language of this chapter. If your brother is distressed by what you're wearing, you ought not to wear it. And how do you know that? So there's issues of freedom like that. Any other examples you could think of other than these? That we've, I think engagement with the world is broad, but that's, you're going to find a lot of examples in that. Would you consider some doctrinal issues possibly um, that are secondary issues to where, you know, you're going to yield to your brother because, you know, we don't have agreement, you know, on this secondary issue, but man, the unity of the church is just not worth, you know, having that fight. I'm going to yield from yeah, it's interesting. Um, like eschatology, I, I, there was um, a man who wanted to find out if First Baptist Durham would be a church for him and wanted to know what I thought about what I call the secret rapture. And uh, I didn't believe in it. And so he chose not to join the church. So I decided not to yield to him at that point. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know if that was the right or wrong thing, but yeah, who knows. All right, let's walk through the verses uh, in detail, verse by verse, start, starting at verse 13. Therefore... Let us stop passing judgment on one another. All right, because we're all going to stand before God's judgment seat, verse 13 uh, says, therefore, we should stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. Now, that's an interesting verse. Here you have the two categories of problematic people in one verse. Who is it that's going to be more tempted to pass judgment on others? The legalistic one, right? Who is it that's more likely to put the stumbling block in the brother's way? The more freedom individual. And so he's giving a shot to some degree to both of them. You stop passing judgment and you stop putting stumbling blocks in front of people, both in one verse. Do you see that? He's dealing with both sides of the equation here. All right. How does the fact that we will all appear before God's judgment seat help us to stop judging other people on these debatable or disputable issues? Well, God's going to do the judgment. It's not our place. Do you think he'll do a good job? <laughs> do you think he needs any help? Like, this is a particularly tough case. Would you mind giving me some counsel on this one? You know, do you think God's asking for any advice on judgment? No. So you are hereby recused or refused or urged not to judge. All right. So how do you do that? If you are judging people and you're wired toward judgmentalism, how would this verse help you? How do you stop judging people when that's your nature, when you've been doing that? Just stop and think what God's going to ask you. Okay. <laughs> when he just judging okay any other thoughts on this people are wired this way sometimes they're judgmental they've had the habit of judging other people now we got this first tell them to stop doing it so how how does somebody get healed of that i mean i think it involves recognizing one that you're judgmental and you know taking it up to the lord in prayer but i think i mean when you focus on your own shortcomings and sins i mean that you don't have near as much time to judge others when you're really examining your own heart and your shortcomings and your sin amen i think that's it the more you immerse yourself in how much you've been forgiven by god the the more you'll be free from judgmentalism second of all the more you realize that the very same things you're judging in other people you do them yourself that basically, this is what Paul says in Romans 2, and Jesus says it in the most famous verse on this, which is, judge not, lest you be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. Jesus is saying, you're doing the same things. You do the exact same things, so you're being a hypocrite. So that would help, um, help you not to be judgmental. Secondly, what is a stumbling block? And how do we put stumbling blocks in front of others? What does that even mean, a stumbling block? Cause someone to fall. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Tom? I got a story, right? So quick, 
We had a young man at one of the churches that we went to. His wife was a believer. She had prayed for years for this young man. He was in his late 20s, early 30s to come to church. He came, started coming to church. And somebody um, made a, a very significant comment about the leather jacket, mm. the black leather jacket that he was wearing. And that was enough. That legalism was enough for him to say, I don't want anything to do mm. with this group of people. It just did not reflect well on the yeah. mind. It's very off-putting to uh, some people. And it's also off-putting to Christians because this is all an in-house affair. We don't see, I think what you're saying, Tom, is absolutely true. But I think in Romans 14, he's, it's totally an, an in-house issue. These are all Christians here. And so he doesn't want, Christians to get sick of being with each other because of the judgmentalism, because that's what's going to happen. Um, so stumbling blocks are things that cause people to fall into sin. So we've already talked about that in verse 15. Do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom uh, Christ died. So the idea of destroy would be also another metaphor is they stumble and fall. They've stumbled into sin. And so don't trip up your brother. Don't cause them to stumble. That's what the stumbling block is. All right, so we've been talking about what kinds of debatable issues Paul is dealing with here. Uh, they're religious issues, um, and we talked about uh, meat sacrificed idols. Paul says, question four, he is fully convinced that no food is unclean in and of itself. What does that, that uh, phrase mean to you, fully convinced or persuaded, completely persuaded that no food is unclean in and of itself? He's absolutely certain, you know, God's position. No doubt. Yeah. Okay. Do you think he went through a process on that topic? I mean, he was raised a Jew. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Do you think it took him a while to be able to eat bacon? I mean, let's be honest. I mean, did that was that a journey for him? Oh, <laughs> it was for Peter. Yeah, I mean, it was for Peter because Peter, you know, was shown a, a, a sheet with all kinds of unclean animals and reptiles and nasty things, remember? And he was told, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And he said, I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. And he said, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. So Jesus declares in Mark 7, all foods clean. It's just an interesting statement there. When I preached through Mark, I shared what an amazing editorial comment that was by the gospel writer Mark. Oh, by the way, in case we didn't know it at that time or you reader didn't know it, at that moment, Jesus is declaring all foods clean. But he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and so it was. It was an early version of the coming of the new covenant. So the old covenant strictures were done. And so Paul implies a certain process or persuasion that he had to go through where he then gets to that point where I guess then I can eat any food that I want. And he got there, all right? And he's fully persuaded that no food is unclean in and of itself. Now, it's, it's hard if you actually read the, the, um, the lists of clean and unclean animals in Deuteronomy and God's very clear with the Jews that they are not permitted to eat these things. So for Jesus to come along and say they're all clean now is interesting, isn't it? Well, let me just ask, did he have that, uh, that right? <laughs> he actually does. He's Lord of the Sabbath and he's Lord of the diet. And he can declare all foods clean. By the way, that's why I'm not a big fan of people saying that the Old Testament restrictions were for dietary health reasons. Okay, do you see why that would be illogical if Jesus then declares all foods clean? It means that Jesus cared very little about the health of Christians, but God cared a lot about the health of Jews, all right? That's why he said, don't eat bacon, all right? Because it's bad for you. But Jesus said, go ahead and eat it as much as you want. Don't worry about it. That's, I, it wasn't for that. He did dietary regulation to set the Jews apart as a, as a unique people. Same thing with all the other things that were then made obsolete by the new covenant. I think that's how we understand it. All right, so he is fully convinced that no food is unclean um, in, in and of itself. But in verse 14, he says, if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. That seems like situational ethics to some degree. How would we understand Paul's statement? The food isn't unclean, but you think it is, therefore for you it is unclean. How do we understand that? Conscience is violating their conscience. Okay. So their conscience isn't there yet. Their faith isn't there yet. He, they, he's already identified them in this chapter as weak. 
which I mean in, in, immature. He's not, they're not where they need to be yet. But until you get there, don't eat it. That's what he's saying. If someone thinks of it that way, if they're not fully developed in their faith yet, they need to refrain. So that, I find that very, very interesting. You know, you've got to wait for your conscience to get to that point. Does, is Paul putting pressure on the weaker brother to become mature in this chapter? Does he want the weaker ones to get where he is on the whole food thing? If so, how does he want them to get there? How does he want, let's say, the Jewish legalists on this to get where he is? He's already said he's fully convinced. He's presenting what he thinks is true. Is that a paradigm or an example for them? He, want, he wants them to follow his example. I think so. He's saying, follow me as I follow Christ. Jesus declared all foods clean. I believe it. You should too. But until you do, don't eat it. That's what he's saying. If someone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. Now, this is really a, a remarkable probing of human beings' minds and psyches and consciences and their understandings of things. It's like it's a process here. So as you're learning, as you're growing, as your conscience is coming along, as you're evolving, you need to act accordingly. At every moment, don't violate your conscience. At every moment, only act by faith. But come along now to full maturity. Get where you need to go. Get to the point where you can eat all the foods that the Lord has said you can eat. That's what's going on in this chapter. But meanwhile, he's talking not just about himself, but talking about others. This is the weaker brother, uh, the one who uh, considers a clean food unclean. All right. What other issue does Paul bring up in verse 15? All right. How are we beholden to someone else's weak faith or conscience? So we've already covered this to some degree, but let's just finalize it. If your brother's distressed by what you eat, what does he say about you? You're no longer acting in love. You're no longer acting in love. So it's unloving for you to distress your brother by your behavior. So fundamentally, we should love our brothers. We should say, okay, is this a problem for you? Find out and say, is this something that's going to cause you to stumble? I don't want to do that. So we should act in love. What does it mean to act in love toward our brother? How do we understand that? What does it mean to act in love? Refrain from doing what you really know you could do. Okay. Right. So... Um, could someone read verse uh, 19 for us? Verse 19. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and the mutual edification. What does that mean? The last part. Mutual edification. Building each other up. I mean, we're encouraged. We're commanded to encourage one another daily. To okay. Build each other up. So is that what it means to act in love toward your brother? I'm going to act toward what will edify him or her. Mutual edification, that's what we're in it, uh, here. What does that word mean? Edification, we use that word from time to time. What does the word edification mean? Help them uh, become the best uh, of who God wants them to be. Okay, I think it's an architectural sense, like there's a building being built, right? An edifice is a building. So there's a building work going on in your brother or sister, right? They're being built toward maturity, built toward Christ-likeness. Do what you can to help that along. Help them build. Do you think that would... Go ahead, Stephanie. Do you think like, it has to do with like, God's word, like teaching sure. God's word, because that will, over time, like be yeah. building people up and sure. bringing them to maturity? Right. If you had a great meat sacrifice to idols dinner planned, I mean, really good meat, <laughs> and along comes a weaker brother, what are you going to do with that meat that night? Are you going to serve it? No, no way. But you're going to have a Bible study tonight. <laughs> we're going to be in the, let's open the word. Let's open a Mark chapter seven. You know, we're going to do some of that. We'll keep the meat in the kitchen or I won't even tell you we bought it. We're having vegetables and broth tonight. All right. But we're also going to have some Bible study. I would love to be able to eat this barbecue with you next month. All right. We're not going to do it tonight, but I want to get there. Would you say that's edification? I think it is. Paul wants the stronger to teach the weaker so that they can become strong too. He doesn't want everyone weak. He doesn't want them to stay weak. He wants their consciences strengthened and come on into their full freedoms in Christ. He doesn't want them legalistic or bound by things that are no longer even issues. So don't eat the meat. Don't cause him to stumble, but teach him. 
help him get to a higher level. That's what I think mutual edification means. Um, I, you know, that's that's how you don't flaunt your freedom. You refrain. You limit your liberty. But that's not all you do. You pray for your brother to grow. Teach him the word of God. See if you can get him to the point where he can say, I am fully persuaded that no food is unclean in itself. Get him there if you can. I think that's what he's looking at here. So he says, um, you're no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy your brother. The opposite of destroy is edify. Don't tear him down. Build him up. And build him up, first of all, by loving him enough not to serve the food that he can't eat, but also by teaching him the word of God. That's what I think he's getting at. And then he says in verse 16, do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. It's an interesting statement. So what is the thing you consider good that might be spoken of as evil? Eating meat. Well, in this case, it's meat. It'd be anything that is a freedom, a matter of freedom for you. Why would it be a problem for him to, for somebody to speak about it as an evil thing? Because God made it. Okay. So it'd be bad for him to speak about a good thing in an evil way. You know, religious legalism is a very dangerous thing. You know, Paul talks about it in other places. Like there are some that forbid marriage, he says. And he calls that in 1 Timothy 5, a doctrine of demons. So legalism isn't just some freebie or it's like an extra careful way to go to heaven. It's a bad religion. And so it's, it's actually demonic in, in its extreme versions. So if God wanted you to eat a food and he created it to be enjoyed and all that, and then there's this individual who's speaking bad about what you're doing, don't let that happen. And he's going to speak bad about it while he's immature and weak in his faith. So grow him up and then he won't speak bad about the good things that you want to enjoy. Do not allow, do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. Go ahead. So how do we apply this to like those kind of worldly liberties you were talking about? Say like movies or dress or whatever. You know, are you, would you say like, okay, so Sonia... You can't watch Marvel movies right now with a good conscience, but I hope one day you are able to. Like, Marvel to movies? apply it like that? <laughs> wow. Or you'd be like, no, it's just better you don't, because that's not really beneficial. Well, I can't answer the question. I think it's something everyone has to answer for him or herself, but be sure everything you partake of is good. That's all. I think that's what I get out of the verse. Make sure that the thing you're watching or wearing or eating or drinking is a good thing. It's a good gift. If you don't think it's good, don't do it. So therefore, everything you partake on, you should see it as a good gift from God that he gave to you to enjoy. If you can't see it that way, then you should, probably shouldn't be doing it. So I don't know about the Marvel movie or the attire that you mentioned or other things. They may not be good. I don't know. There's some things that just aren't good. But if they are good and somebody is just very legalistic about it, like it could be like you brought up the music. You know, we had to get through that on changing our music types. And there were certain folks that I think were overly legalistic and restrictive about music. They believed it was sinful for us to have a contemporary sound for Sunday morning worship, like especially the drums, which were a symbol of that new style of music, were evil, were considered evil, almost demonic for them. I think that would be a good example of something I would consider good, but they were speaking of as evil. Does that make sense? So that might be an example. That's when I taught, we taught about the history of Christian worship over 20 centuries, talked about the extent of different worship styles around the world. So we went back in time and around the world and came up with this one statement, God likes more forms of worship than you do. <laughs> true or false true. if you say false then you realize what you said no me and god are in lockstep absolutely we totally agree about music and it's like well you need to be more humble you need to realize that your narrow views of music are probably legalistic and harmful so the sonia that's the best i can do it just i will say this at every moment it's really just a different version of verse 23 make sure everything you partake in you consider a good gift from God that he is giving to you to enjoy. If you can't see it that way, then don't do it, I would say. And if you consider it good, then, then you got that other situation If somebody thinks it's evil, then you're in this verse. Do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. Now, you can't control what other people say. But what he's saying here is be careful about flaunting your freedoms in front of such people. Be careful about the way you live your life, because if you do, they're going to be 
speaking bad about what you serve for dinner or things like that, okay? And then he says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So this is a beautiful thing here. Paul is now lifting uh, the eyes of his readers up above the nitty gritty of food and, and other detailed arguing topics to the issue of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is what we're talking about here. That's related to mutual edification. What does he mean by the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit? What does that phrase mean to you, the kingdom of God? Spiritual matters. Okay. How does that relate to edification? Edification is a building project. Is the kingdom of God a building project? It actually is. It's going on all the time. Through evangelism and discipleship, the kingdom of God is growing and building and developing every day. That's what we're about here. Not eating and drinking. That's not what we're about here. It's about the kingdom of God. It's not a matter of eating and drinking. But what is it? What does he say? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. All right, so Jim, what do those words mean to you? The kingdom of God is a matter of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. One of the most critical qualities uh, of Christianity, of, of our faith. Okay, so let's talk about each of them. First of all, what does righteousness mean? Our standing with God. It's one of two possibilities. It could either be justification righteousness or a practical daily righteousness of behavior, right? So which is it here? Is he talking about our imputed righteousness through faith in Christ? Or is he talking about our righteous behavior in a daily life pattern? I think the latter. I think so. Yeah, one founded on the other. Because we have been declared not guilty of all our sins. We then have a righteous way of living with each other. There is a righteous lifestyle. And I think he's looking at that, that practical righteous lifestyle. So is he, are you getting out of this chapter, anything goes, do whatever makes you happy? No, there's a righteous, holy lifestyle that he has in mind here. It's not anything goes. It's certainly not sexual liberation here, like the libertines would teach. It's righteousness, and then peace. What is? How does peace relate to this chapter? Not arguing all the time. Yeah, that's not peaceful. I can tell you, I've been to some very not peaceful members meetings in this church years ago. The ones that that we have now, um, you know, are just such a delight to me because we talk about ministry things. We talk, you know, but we had some shootout at the OK Corral members meetings that peace was like the last thing on my mind. Uh, they were very, very contentious years ago, long time ago. Um, but if you're having conflicts with brothers and sisters and they're tearing at each other and slandering each other and talking each other down, that's not peaceful. The kingdom of God is a matter of righteousness, peace, and then it says joy in the Holy Spirit. What does that mean to you, the word joy? How does it relate to this chapter? Righteousness, peace, and joy. Freedom. Freedom from all the regulations. Yeah. I don't think legalists are joyful people. And did you sense the Pharisees just living a life of joy? <laughs> it's like, I think legalism is a joy killer. Yeah. It really is. But ironically, so is license. It's a joy killer too. Because you go do whatever you want, and after a while it doesn't satisfy, and you're like, what is this? And, and you realize, no, what I need is to live for God. And these things, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, that's life. That's what our life together should be like. And I think we should think of this in a corporate setting. The kingdom of God together is a matter of us sharing together a righteous life, a peace that we enjoy together, and joy that we delight in each other. JP, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just saying it in, the joy is in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. It's not in getting my own life. Yeah, and I think the Holy Spirit here, I think, primarily is that bond that unifies different people and makes them one. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. The Spirit makes us one. And so we're going to seek a unity together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Even in the midst of these controversial topics, we're going to delight in life together. So I'm not going to eat meat if it causes you to stumble, but I'm going to try to help you grow to maturity. 
Um, we're going to enjoy life together. We're not going to judge each other. We're not going to st- cause each other to stumble. We're going to be one together, Jew and Gentile together, believer in Christ, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's the vision he's giving for their corporate life together. It's very beautiful if you think about it. And, you know, a church like that has evangelistic power, has the power to change the world. And that's what he's wanting to get at. So let's not get dragged down into these things because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. So this is how he wants all Christians to be serving Christ. Caring horizontally about brothers and sisters, refraining from flaunting liberties, living for the kingdom of God and the glory of God and the advancement of the gospel. If you serve Christ that way, what does he say? If you serve Christ, anyone who serves Christ in that way is pleasing to God and approved by men. What do those things mean to you? Pleasing to God, approved by men. It's pleasing to God because you're obeying him. Mm-hmm. And then I think approved by, by men is that, um, of that whole idea of, you know, the purpose of the church is to, is to have the, the lost world look at us and say, what is happening? Right. You know, why? It's just, you're, it's kind of like shock and awe. Right. You know, the gospel has that power when people are so used to seeing contentiousness and I have to have my way at no matter whatever cost and they see someone yielding to a brother. I mean, that is, that can be so powerful. Amen. Yeah, I think when, in 1 Corinthians 9 where Paul says, I've become all things to all men so they've all possibly means my safe son. He's like, I know how to be with this kind of person. I know how to be with that kind of person. I know how to function. In a Gentile home that's offering me meat, I'm going to eat it. In a, in a Jewish home where they're unconverted yet, they're not Christians yet, and I'm trying to win them to Christ, I can do the kosher thing. I know how to do that too. I can do that. Now, that's evangelistic in 1 Corinthians 9. But how much more than in the church? I know how to be with everybody. I know how to be with the weaker brother. I know how to be with the more legalistic brother. I know how to be with people and so, therefore, I'm pleasing to them in a good way. He's not a people pleaser, but he is pleasing to them. Does that make sense? There is a difference between being pleasing to people and being a people pleaser, right? You, you know what that is. It's got to do with motive. I'm not in it to try to make you happy. I'm not going to change my morals. But Paul's saying these kind of people are pleasing to people. They're just pleasant to be around. They're not contentious. They're not argumentative. They're not stirring up trouble. They're pleasing to God and approved by others, by people. All right. Therefore, he says, let us make every effort to do at least a peace and a mutual edification. So some of this is hard work. Fundamentally, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. He says, there's lots of effort in Christian unity. Church life is hard. People are complex. People are coming from different backgrounds, but it's worth it, he's saying. Make every effort, he says, to do at least a peace and to mutual edification. We've already talked about that. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Get the feeling you could almost read it like, for the sake of food, for goodness sake. It's just food. You know, and he says this in, in 1 Corinthians 8 through 10. He says, I'm not helped if I don't eat, or I'm not helped if I do eat. And it's like, food is nothing. My, I'm not here on earth to eat. That's like your God is your stomach. He's like, that's not what this is all about. So don't destroy the work of God for the sake of food. That's not why you live. Um, it's the same thing in Corinthians, you know, where he talks about the lawsuits. Yeah. He said, just give in. Yeah. It's, why not rather be wronged? It's like, what do you want? It's like, go the extra mile. You want to sue me and take my business? Sure, go ahead, have it. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And he says, all food is clean, but it's wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat. And this is the first time he mentions wine here or to drink wine or to cause or do anything that will cause your brother to fall. Why do you think he mentions wine? Again, it's not even come up up to this point. This is the first time he mentions it in the chapter. There must have been people abusing it. Okay. Could that be an area of Christian freedom that gets flaunted sometimes or causes people to stumble? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are there were sects, uh, the Nazarites, that didn't eat anything that came from the grape at all, and the Rechabites, the same thing. And so they're aware that this is a problem. Um, I remember when I was preaching through Genesis, I got to the story of, of Noah's drunkenness, and uh, I addressed the topic of wine in the Bible got into trouble on that one. I don't get a lot of trouble here, but I was, uh, I said that, you know, in the Bible, wine is presented as a dangerous blessing. 
Well, the person who came up to me was pretty legalistic about alcohol and said, why did you say blessing? It's just dangerous. I said, because biblically, it's not just dangerous. So how would you say biblically that wine is a dangerous blessing, biblically? First of all, is it a blessing biblically? What is biblical evidence that the Bible thinks of wine as a blessing? Well, the, the thing is, wine can be a lot of things. I mean, it can be grapes, it can be grape juice, it can be alcoholic. So, I mean, it's a big category. All right, let's keep it's it simple. Cana, it let's let's wine. keep it simple. Just <laughs> wine, the way you think of wine. All right, wedding at Cana is kind of proof that it's a blessing. <laughs> this guy, by the way, that came up to me, he's not in the church anymore, but he came up. He was, I mentioned the wedding at Cana, and I think he was, he was not deterred by that at all. That didn't move the needle. I was like, do you think Jesus did the right thing by changing the water into wine? He, did, he, he abstained from answering the question. He was so convinced that alcohol is nothing but a curse and, and dangerous. But it's not just the uh, wedding at Cana in Galilee. In the Old Testament, there are many examples of wine being a blessing. Many examples. It's poured out as an offering. Yes. But is it only a blessing? Why did I add the word dangerous? Well, think of the text I was preaching on. What happened to Noah? He got drunk. And his sons had to cover his nakedness walking in backward in the tent. That's not a good scene. That's Noah in the Bible at his worst. Or Lot. Yeah, Lot as well got drunk, etc. So, And there's not one or two examples of this. I think that Nadab and Abihu were drunk when they offered unauthorized fire because later in the same chapter it says the priest should not be drinking strong drink before they go in to offer. You know, in the, in the context, it seemed like they were drunk and God struck them dead. There are lots of examples of why it's dangerous. My point in bringing the story up, though, is mostly this brother's reaction to me. It's a controversial topic. It's difficult for some people because there has been a history of drunkenness that's destroyed families. It's destroyed whole lives. And so I think that's why he adds it here. I'm choosing, he says, to not eat meat or to drink wine or do anything that will cause my brother to stumble, whatever it would be. Um, so whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. What does he mean by that? Whatever you think about these controversial topics, keep quiet about it. <laughs> why does he say that? Keep it between yourself and God. Don't judge. Don't be a proselytizing evangelist for your perspective on these controversial issues. Don't go around saying, you all need to get where I'm at. Why does he say, why does he say that? Keep between yourself and God. Yes, how do you do that if you're going to try to help your brother grow? I don't think Paul's putting himself in this category. Because oh. he's teaching on this. But he's talking to the general church. He doesn't want everyone going around talking about these controversial issues all the time. Why not? It's going to cause division. It's going to cause division. Is that why they're assembling on Sunday? Hey, let's get together and talk about meat sacrificed to idols. What do you say? It's like, no, why don't we talk about Christ crucified and resurrected? Why don't we talk about winning Rome to faith in Christ? Why don't we talk about the joys of heaven? We don't need to be here talking meat sacrifice to idols and whether we should drink wine or not. I think that's what it is. Don't make this the central issue of your church fellowship. Keep quiet about it. And then when the right time comes, maybe talk about it, etc. Blessed is a man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. Interesting verse. All right. We're almost out of time. But in other words, be sure that your conscience is clear in what you do. I think that's what he means. Don't act in any way that would violate your conscience. Blessed is a man who lives a life free uh, where his conscience is free. That's why Paul says to Felix, I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. Blessed is the man who does that. I think that's what he's getting at. But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats. Don't eat if you have doubts. Don't do anything if you have doubts. And why? Because anything that does not come from faith is sin. All right, we're out of time and we're out of verses. So uh, we'll, God willing, resume next week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time we've had to walk through this magnificent and complex chapter. I thank you for how marvelously balanced it is as he addresses different types of people in the Roman church, legalists on one side, licensed individuals on the other, people who are doing whatever they, uh, they wanted to do and flaunting their freedoms, others that were le leading self-controlled, careful lives. He was addressing everyone, and I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for the way that we have been instructed in this chapter to care about brothers and sisters in the body of Christ and to do whatever we can 
to lead to mutual peace and edification. Help us do that at FBC. In Jesus' name, amen. Stay motivated to grow to spiritual maturity by accessing free biblical content at twojourneys.org. Help others in their spiritual growth by sharing these resources, praying for Two Journeys, and supporting the mission financially by visiting twojourneys.org slash donate.